Well, thank you very much indeed for coming um, to Bonn from Leipzig and for, for um, being willing to give a, a talk about uh, well, what you are doing at the moment, about your research, and um, I give to the public just a few information on your background and uh, then the process is um, Enrique Martino, San Juan de la Fierva, postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Complutense University of Madrid and holds a PhD for the Institute of Asian and African Studies, Humboldt University in Berlin. He was a postdoctoral fellow in global history at the University of Freiburg and at the Global Network for Global History Project at the University of Göttingen. He has published articles in journals like, such as Comparative, Africa, African Economic History, History in Africa, and uh, in the International Review of Social History. And he has recently published in 2022 films, including Indentured Labor in the Gulf of Guinea, and uh, in the year before, 2021, How to Create a Labor Market in Colonial Situations, Spanish Guinea, Southern Cameroon, and Northern Gabon, from the 1890s to the 1940s. And uh, while well, today the talk will be, we can see it here just in a second, about the exchange structures of the slave trade, money, means, metrology, African, in Atlantic Africa. So thank you again for coming and the floor is you to thank you very much the talk. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for connecting. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's, it's, it's to present kind of my ongoing research project into, into money in, in, in West Africa, past and present. Um, but this is focused on the pre colonial period. Um, and I know it's similar, similar structures are going on in other places, even other epochs, other zones. But I don't know exactly how. So uh, I look forward to any discussions in the comparative uh, dimensions. Uh, in a science, in a new science, I think, which could be called paleometrology, the study of archaic or disused or defunct units of account, uh, in this case, units, monetary units. Um, it's a complicated new science, old science. Um, this, I'll start with an example of what I mean by the, the, the imaginary units of account that kind of mediated and structured the, the trade and slave trade, and also other trades. Trade before the slave trade, and also the trade after the slave trade in the 19th century, very similar structure. Um, so it seems quite complicated. This is from a British captain in the early 19th century who gives you a kind of index for if you want to buy a certain gallons of palm oil, what do you need to uh, pay uh, for it? So here it tells you if it's at eight coppers. So coppers is the unit of account in Calabar uh, to buy palm oil. There are, it's an imaginary unit. You don't actually have to bring coppers to pay for coppers. The copper is constituted by a variety of things. It was called assortment, sortings, bundles. Um, so here you can see, for example, salt, kegs of gunpowder. And there's also some structure here. It's usually uh, one to five or one to four. So the, the, a, a large unit would cost four or five. Um, and a smaller, for example, spoons or looking glass or some small handkerchiefs of, of Roma, they would only cost one. So this kind of, you can already see that each good has a different unit weight. You know, some, some goods are one, some goods are four, but all of them are, are necessary in order to kind of constitute the, the, the unit. So a trade couldn't occur if you didn't transact all the available trade goods. So you couldn't just pay in salt, you couldn't just pay it in, in, in compound, it had to be a, a, an assortment of all available goods. And for example, if the price increase, this is a broker, the palm oil vendor in Calabar, would tell you, okay, I'm selling this gallon of palm oil for eight coppers. You can also change the price, you know, you increase the price to 18, 16 coppers. And then the composition would, would change a bit. So the salts and the gunpowder and the iron bars, they're kind of the core of the bundle. They remain the same, but other things get added to it. For example, fine hat, 14 coppers, other small articles, 10 coppers, small articles, usually jewelry and different things. Um, so here you can see the price increases. It's not like the, the, the same amount of goods are transacted, but other goods get added to the bundle. Usually, um, so it's kind of a complex trade structure, but there's a few kind of main main elements, main main, uh, main characteristics. Um, and this kind of imaginary unit, I mean, it, it's quite complicated. Even uh, Zimmer, the great philosopher of money, notes that it's very complicated. You know, when 
money is used just as a standard value, but not for actual payment. So it's not there's no coinage, there's no mature embodiment of the, the value. Um, because the, the, the in a function of money, it's independent the to act as a kind of unit as a measure of value. And it goes, you know, in prehistory in different places in Africa today, the present day, the exchange of goods are carried out according to a monetary standard, which is sometimes quite complicated. But money itself, in a coinage sense, does not for the most part exist. So to Zimmer says it's complicated, it's, it's really quite complicated. And in, in this, when Zimmer writes about this, he's kind of implicitly and explicitly relying on this German archaeologist from the late 19th century called Heinrich Schulz, who has this book called Grundriss and Engineeringsgeschichte des Geldes. Kind of outline of the origins of money, which is one of my side projects is to translate this. Um, and there he kind of goes into detail about you know, the, the money faltigkeit from Kaufpreis and Elfenbein and Sklavenhandel. So about these kind of imaginary units of account in the, in the African trade. You know, it's obviously not exclusive to Africa, it's in different places. You know, in, in Cameroon, it's the crew in Angola, it's the, 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 the piece, the, the strip. Um, and it's unclear, he calls it a kind of African unit. But it's unclear if it's either African or European, because obviously the European merchants, they're also quite comfortable managing within these imaginary units. They also take, do some of their accounting in these units. Um, and it's unclear who introduced them or when they emerged from the 18th century. It's a, bit, uh, it's a bit unknown. But here I'm more interested in this kind of uh, you know, ongoing function and structure in the 18th, 19th century. And then he also notes, you know, the European a trader, he likes the system uh, because um, even though it's kind of quite complicated, it requires a lot of patience, uh, it's part, he likes it because he uses it properly, that's how he makes his profit. So the kind of the logic of, of profitability in the sector comes actually through the unit. And I, I want to explain kind of how. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the first to explain this because actually Polanyi explained it perfectly well already. In this, in, this, in this kind of interesting article published in 1964 uh, called Sortings in the Alms Trade in the West African Slave Trade. And then here it's interesting to see its first draft. He called it, you know, it was in a rap that fictitious European money of account of the slave trade. It crosses out the European because he's like, okay, maybe it's not really just European, it's also African because Africans also amongst themselves are also using uh, the imaginary unit of account. Um, so here by, by the Alms and by the Sortings, Trade, what he calls these two elements, or what I already explained in the beginning, or the ounce is the unit, uh, which is imaginary. It's not actually a gold ounce, it's just a fictitious unit which other commodities get weighed or measured by. The same as the other units, coppers and calabar, bars uh, in various parts of the coast, ponds, panos, cloths. Um, and this kind of shows that you know the the, the trade was structured through a kind of monetary uh, monetary medium which shows that money isn't necessarily a thing it's not even a quantity uh, it's a flow it's the kind of it's what's structured the flux of the flow the kind of the proportions of different things in relation via the unit um and the merchants and, and both on the african side and the, uh, and the european side it was quite clear that this is how trade operates so you know even as this after the slave trade um it's still the same kind of uh, mechanism to trade all all traffic is carried in this region by barter which I'll go on to explain and critique, what is known as the round trade or bundle trade, where all the assorted goods need to be represented in the payment. Um, and, you know, he lists up a variety of things, muskets, powder, brass pans, copper rods, but the important thing is in what proportion and what shifting proportion. So this kind of inherent dy dynamism and shift within the units are kind of what explains both the profitability of, of, of trades, say trade and other trades, and also, um, and also the kind of spread and uh, success of the trade in different areas. So this is just to highlight from the sources, um, you know, the what Polanyi kind of insists is going on here, which is this desire for stability in monetary exchange. So the fact that prices don't fluctuate, the imaginary unit is stable. So. And then this is a missionary 1850s in Calabar. Also, he says to him, a piece of cloth, whatever it costs, is charged at five bars. So, whatever it costs to the European, if the European can source from a supplier cloth at whatever different price, uh, at the coast, it will always be five bars. So, um, 
So, so the difference, maximizing this difference is where the kind of source of merchant uh, gain is. Um, and even the, 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 the kind of, the, it, it's very regionally. So in every delta, basically, even upriver in different areas, there was kind of almost a different unit in the sense of what proportion uh, goods had to be transacted for. So it's kind of high, highly variable across the coast, all these different imaginary units. Um, <clears throat> and the sorting as well vary. Um, and then if you actually track the components of, 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 uh, of, this, of what constitutes the, the packet, which is also a name of the imaginary unit in every coast, the packet, um, you can kind of see that you know, clearly the source of profit in the trade, even the slave trade, actually is in the first segment the, the, from Europe to, uh, to Africa. If you can secure your goods that are being traded on the coast for five coppers or five packets um, you know, from cheaper sources in Europe or with cheaper manufacturing methods, for example, here is, is noticed that in the early 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, merchants paid one franc for uh, the, the guineas, the blue cloth that was exchanged in Senegambia, and they sold it at the equivalent rate of 30 francs in gum price. So, what they, the gum Arabica, they received in return to some of France. So here's the kind of the key ratio because if you reduce your cost price in Europe, obviously the cost price is the same. And even the, the Gum Arabica and the other maybe local prices, uh, the price of the things that you actually export from Africa increased in different moments in the nineteenth century, so the commodity booms and even kind of the slave booms in the forties, then you're there your margin profit is much higher. So you can't disaggregate the bundle. I mean you have to disaggregate the bundle, you can't just average prices. In, in even in regions or in, in cloths, there's different types of cloths with different cost production. So if you average, you lose the, these entire dimensions of what kind of in, in impulse and, and provided the kind of mo motive for the trade. Um, so, I mean, here again, what I just said, but in, in kind of, um, in again, this image from the first source from Captain Adams. And he said, obviously for the Europeans, they kept account books in European monies as well, because to, to run a successful trade operation, all you cared about was two prices. The price of your cost price in England or wherever in some port in Europe, um, and the final sale of whatever you were exporting from Africa. So in the end, the merchants, they don't keep, all this trade doesn't happen on one account book, they're separate account books. But for the European, the, the, the ultimate trade is obviously priced in, um, in, in their own currency and what they want to accumulate. So here they tell you, for example, the, the cost price in England of India cloths, the, the different types of cloths and barrels. Um, and you also provide the exchange rate to the imaginary units, the, in this case, Calabar. In every area, there's this kind of its own exchange rate. And here you can actually calculate, you can see that, for example, the ton of salt, uh, the, the ratio is one to 62. So one pound to 62 coppers. For gunpowder, it's uh, one to one to a hundred around. Uh, even though the, the kind of official exchange rate or the average exchange rate is one to fifty, for this reason, it's much more profitable for the trader to bring in uh, barrels of gunpowder and salt. Um, so it's kind of the trader is incentive is obviously to start kind of substituting uh, the bundle with different things that are cheaper to him, and this is what keeps the kind of this is what marks successful merchant. There's also unsuccessful merchants who bring a lot of goods from England that just don't trade at a higher level on the coast and in the end they don't make a profit. There's a lot of uh, boom, uh, you know, successful and unsuccessful trades. We have to know what to bring. And this knowledge is actually a trade secret. If you read the merchant accounts, they never tell anyone what exactly is going rate, what rate ratio in which part of the coast, etc. This is how they make money. This is their, their, their trade secret. This the English captain published because he heard it from the traders, but there's very few uh, very little documentation like this. Um, there's some merchant records themselves. This is from an earlier period in the 17th century where the Portuguese use the pan, the cloth as the unit. And here you can see uh, even the Portuguese traders here in Guinea, uh, Manuel Batista, and these articles by Linda Newsom, who found this merchant handbooks in the archive of Peru. Uh, um, so, you know, the lucky find, and she kind of does this interesting accounting studies uh, on the, the how merchants manage their accounts. And, you know, um, you can see they kind of kept their accounting books in, in the panels, but this is obviously separate from their European 
their, their, their European account books. So there's a kind of, it's not Congress, it's a separate account books. And, the, and, that, and that's where the kind of, uh, the magic of the merchant profit happens. And here it's just to uh, illustrate again um, how it was all along the coast, for example, from Senegal, this is from uh, Angola in the late 18th century. Yeah, uh, is actually quite difficult to evaluate in French money because of the different kind of coin rates. So here it says, for example, we're going to buy 600 slaves in Angola. We need to bring at least 35,000 PS uh, pieces. And the piece is an imaginary unit. Uh, for example, a piece of guinea blue, which is the blue cloth, is actually worth three pieces. Um, and the kind of, you know, depending on where your suppliers are, from Gwen, from Lezin, from Pondicherry, from Batavia, you know, depending on the, the kind of the sorting of the commodities, is what determines um, the kind of uh, the profitability of the trade in the end. But also the key thing I want to highlight is also it's, 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 a, it's a bundle which requires big items, which are called grand these all on the coast is also a distinction between big items and small items. The big items are essential items. They need to, they need to always be present in the bundle. You cannot conduct the trade without it. So in, in Angola was always cloth, which is also the pre-colonial currency. Uh, they, they, along the coast, they made their own kind of cloth currencies out of raffia palm. Um, so the Europeans, they're basically money orders in a sense. They substitute, they, uh, they counterfeit, they bring imports mimicking the, the pre-colonial monies. Um, and this is the case also for iron and copper and different things. So these commodity currencies, they're money in the sense that, you know, that's why thinking of it in terms of barter is uh, the state on various fronts. Um, but, you know, the, the key thing is that money is also flexible because other, other items can be added to the bundle. So if you, you know, bring in new, new food seals in terms of weaponry, they get initially they're seen as you know, not essential part of the component, and then they become an essential part of the component. So in order to conduct trade, you actually need to bring the new items of, of goods so then they become monetized because they're obligatory, they're transacted in every single transaction, etc. Um, it's not just a category of, uh, of kind of good, it's a monetary good. Um, and here, the um, and here it's difficult to, to account for, you know, for the individual trades because these merchant records aren't that uh, easy to access or even available. But more or less, you get a sense of the proportion uh, through this kind of you know broad economic, macroeconomic data or you know, the final system or in the seventies, I think. And it says you know. The value of African export of the Atlantic world to 6.5 million. Imports to Africa were around 2 million. So that's kind of the ratio of the merchant profitability. I mean, they, 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 that means they export 6.5 million worth of goods that they sell to European or Atlantic markets. They export 6.5 million worth of goods that they sell to European or Atlantic markets. And they only need to import 1.7 million worth of European goods in these two price points in Europe. No? Um, so there you get a sense that um, um, what the kind of the profit rate of, of the, the state trade was. Um, but you can, in the end, you can't really average it because it depends. You know, it depends on the area and it depends on the, on the merchants. Um, and an interesting historian of the Luango coast in northern Angola, um, she calls it, you know, it was, it was unclear the trade didn't have this kind of, um, um, you know, certainty. She calls, you know, every journey to the Luango coast is a new gamble. Because of the type of goods that you were going to bring, because of possibly shifting components of that goods, if you didn't have all the available goods, then you couldn't conduct a trade, um, and and someone else would take a trade from you if they actually brought that 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 good. Um, so it was always a risky enterprise. Um, and you know, so some there's been some studies about average profitability in the slave trade, but this averaging out is kind of it 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 removes the entire impulse and dynamism of the trade because. We actually look at there's been a few studies of the Liverpool slave trade that show that the, the profitability can vary from 100, 200, 300 percent to minus 90. You know, that's the, 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 the mean amount of, of profit is either 200 percent or minus 90, 90, which is a kind of gambling structure. Either you double your money in one voyage in one, in one year, or you lose all of it because you know you can't unload or transact or arrive at the destination, or it corrodes, these are material goods, so they corrode. 
they waste away, etc. Um, so this is the structure of the slave trade. It's kind of a, a gambling structure. You know, you, you can double your money or lose it all. It's not just this kind of incremental kind of investment because there's been arguments made that oh, the average profitability of the sector was 11 percent, which is kind of like UK government bonds in the 18th century. So it's like you know, no European would organize this venture of the slave trade for 10 percent if they can just get that money holding government bonds. So you lose the entire dynamism behind it if you average out the prices. And here is just another interesting kind of report from a slave trader who wrote his memoirs, Captain Cano. Uh, and then, so here is quite clear about how the profitability of a slave voyage works. Uh, expenses, you know, captain, the boat, etc. 200,000 cigars, 500 doubloons, the gold coin, and cargo, about $10,000. Um, and then the, the returns are $80,000. Expenses are 40,000 total. So it's kind of, um, you double your, your profit in, in one trip, 1840 is to Cuba. But the profit comes from the type of cargo that you have, because even the doubloons, which are the gold coins, um, they're not current in West Africa. So there's no gold and silver money in use, except in this brief period where Cuban slave traders to transact on the West African coast, they need British manufactured goods. That's what makes the slave trade profitable, bringing in cloth, cheapened by the Industrial Revolution, uh, different things, you know, bringing in muskets, Manchester cottons and Liverpool lead, all of which are swapped in Sierra Leone, Accra, or, or Spanish or Brazilian bills on London, or, or, or just Spanish and Brazilian gold coins. So there's a, a lot of British merchants, even during the abolition of the slave trade, the British merchants set up coast, set up uh, merchant shops, factories all over Sierra Leone, Gold Coast, et cetera. And their main customers are the Cubans buying those goods <coughs> with gold coins. <coughs> otherwise they can't transact with African brokers. <coughs> um, and here, this is from an interesting report by where the parliament interviews the slave traders or even just the merchants who come back to report on what the slave trade is like in the 1840s. And then, you know, um, he says, you know, the structure of the trade, the legitimate trade in the slavery is very similar. Same goods are used to, to transact. Um, trade by exchange of goods is more profitable, probably, than by the exchange of money. He asks the parliamentarian, and the guy is interviewing the merchant from Sierra Leone. He says, yes, it is, of course. The slavers can purchase them much cheaper with goods than with goods. Um, and here, also, another merchant says, you know, uh, it's, you know the return is obviously better if, you, if, you, if you're not paying with money, it's also more profitable because even once the legitimate trade starts, you know, palm oil trade, ivory, rubber, and even alongside the slave trade, all these trades, they're, they're quite profitable. Um, exactly because it has this kind of, um, this, uh, this vagueness or this, this fixity of price in local units. Um, so here it says that the profitability depends entirely upon the profit obtained upon the outward investment how far the trade is beneficial. So it depends entirely on your cost, unit cost in Europe, um, the profitability of, uh, of the trade. This is just to confirm my points, uh, which are kind of, um, you know, quite, quite evident, but, you know, it's difficult to kind of quantify and even argue because it's, to people it's mysterious because they don't know where the source of the merchant profit is. Uh, because the, thinking in barter, you assume that, Things that equivalent value, you know. Um, but there's, you know, uh, I'll explain this a bit later, I think. Let's just say, you know, what the, the, he describes Sierra Leone as, you know, it's a mercantile colony. The objects of these merchants, or well, its magistrates, uh, you know, the entire kind of unit was also a kind of, um, a kind of merchant legal domain, you know. That's why the unit is so important. It's not just uh, this trade amongst merchants. It's kind of the unit represents a contract, you know, this for that at this point in time, or in repayment in these type of goods, or at this rate, you know, it's a kind of it sets a device. It's not just a kind of a, a market price. So um, this would be just to continue with the idea that has been kind of very well researched by Toby Green for the 17th century. You know, the, you know, up until the 1850s, the overwhelming bulk of imports into West Africa were currencies. And here he means what at the time were considered actual currencies for being, being used as currencies in the material sense, like calories, 
like panels in certain areas where you actually use cloth. But then over the course, at some point after the 16th, 17th century, they become imaginary, they, they dematerialize. Um, and here, a lot of the literature starts describing these trade goods as kind of just barter goods or material goods, but no, they're still, they're still currency goods um, because they kind of, um, because there's this demand for them as monetary goods rather than as consumption goods. Um, so, because locally, I mean, I'll, I'll get into this briefly, but just to say that, um, you know, the, here, this is kind of interesting book about the oil and the gold and different trades. Well, as I said, you know, there's some Spanish dollars now in West Africa in the 1840s, but they're all quickly evacuated. The British merchants who received that in return for the, for the cloths, they sent it back to London, of course. Um, and then, and then here it says, you know, it's well known that the trade on the coast of Africa, neither gold or silver made use of measures of value, but an ideal standard has been adopted, originating the period when the Europeans first resorted to that coast. The standard called the bar, in this case, and you may have different names in different places. Um, and then, so its point is that you know, everything is measured against these imaginary bars, and gold is just a mere commodity here. So it's it's less, it's it's cheaper to buy gold in, in Ghana, Gold Coast. Uh, because it doesn't function as money. Um, whereas if you turn that argument around, the fact that these cloths and iron bars that are function as money also increases their value. That's why there's a discrepancy in the end, because uh, all, for African societies, all these goods, they represent monetary goods that they have to, that they used to pay their social debts, their, um, their matrimonial debts, there are membership fees in societies. Um, so they don't consume these goods. Some of it is consumed. They don't decorate their houses with it. Some of it, they decorate themselves with it. It's a bit like gold. Even 70% of gold is still used for decorative purposes. Altars, jewelry, only 30% of gold has a monetary function as a hoard of value that you can always transact with. And uh, in different African societies, this hoard is kind of is represented by different goods. Boss, um, valuable items that need to be passed on constantly to, to settle debts with in laws, with trading partners. Um, so here you can see this is a nice image. Uh, a German trader in 1870, these are his, his, his brokers and agents who he sends out to the different villages to trade. And he says, This is what he gets for one heavy tusk of ivory. These are the gunpowder, the copper Neptunes, some, some shells. Um, some cloths and all these goods, it's not like they're consumed. They're passed on. This is a diagram of bride wealth, the uh, la dot, la dote, you know, what it costs a woman, sogo costs, you know, same type of arrangement, assortment in the imaginary unit. Well, they're not really imaginary, they also have a separate local units, different societies. That's what makes them different societies. They have their own units under which they kind of trade and settle their debts in. Uh, salt, bag of fair, iron, pines, cloth, etc. You know, so in a certain sense, this is an extension of African trading practices, uh, even on the coast. And it's it's not permanent; it, 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 it's adjustable. So if there's a boom, the demand increases. You know, we need to get more weapons or more uh, cloths. If there's more of that, if there's a trade boom um, because right off isn't just one payment; it's just kind of ongoing demands for uh, different uh, different goods. And here, this is also the key monetary I mentioned that you know this influx of money actually represents the, the force of kind of multiplication. Bride wealth is necessary to establish paternity, um, also to marry, but not necessarily. It's more of a kind of device to kind of, uh, call offspring your own. So clearly, this influx of money is, is related to kind of you know for people in African societies. Money is usually conceived as coming from abroad, external. Even though initially it's self-produced, you know, like in Congo, they produce their own money, cloth money, from the Rafa palms, different traditions and societies have their own kind of monetary productions. Um, but in the end, this influx, the imaginary of, 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 of wealth and fortune and multiplication is kind of these outside sources, material goods, because they are used in order to expand their societies through monetary conquests, which is you know, other people you marry other people by paying them. And that's how a lot of societies kind of expand and grow. Um, 
and this is more of an ethnographic argument, but it's uh, it's the key because it's what explains the migration. And this is just to, to briefly end on kind of the critiques because you know Africa, even in 1900, its population is bigger than the, all of the Americas, 150 million people. And when people think of barter, when they use barter, they think of these you know of kind of flea market, remote Polynesian, Amazonian kind of trade. And the fact that even in the 19th century, these trades in Africa were classified as barter. It kind of removed them from this kind of from the from the from the dynamism of, of trade and world trade and then the volume of it of what was going on because you know this famous kind of neoclassical founder of economics or co-founder of Jevons, he started off this book on money with fire and he's like, you know, it's just there's something absurdly congruous the fact that the joint stock company and the stock exchange called the African Barter Company, because of this disjunction of the imaginary, you know, there's literally a company in Liverpool and stock market producing partner goods for payment of not only more slaves, but of local produce, palm oil, etc. So they're basically a kind of mint. They're a monetary, um, um, it's a mass money market being uh, produced outside of, of, of Africa. Um, so this is in the end the, 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 the dynamic here that is missed by, you know, again, what I said before, really, you know, the, this imaginary of barter is that it's not monetary, it can be monetary, it's barter. Is a merchandise in exchange for another merchandise of equal value. You know, this for that, to, for that, rather than being mediated through a unit um, and not being those properly monetary. Um, and then, in, interestingly, once the neoclassical theories of barter took hold, <coughs> became dominant in the early 20th century, money was simply conceived also as a type of very efficient barter, just equal value, tit for tat. We just use money to lubricate the whole process. So there's actually no monetary dimension that creates kind of different values and different exchange rates for different people and sources of profit, et cetera. And uh, it's not there that they're, so in the end, they don't look at the African cases with a different eye because it's like, oh, they're just doing efficient market trading. But in the end, it's, you know, you can't really understand the structure of the trade because, um, because it's not just this kind of trade. The money dimension is the key. This was known already before. A lot of the, the Enlightenment philosophy, this is from Montesquieu, a lot of the political economy, classical political economy, not neoclassical from the 19th century, is, is aware about these different units and imaginary units of account and, and call them and such. But they actually only use them as a metaphor for their idea of that money is an immaterial thing, a, a numeraire, a simple number. It doesn't have to be actual intrinsic value, gold, etc. This was a realization of the 19th century or 18th century. So it says, for example, well, the black sun goes to Africa and a sign of values without money. It's a purely ideal sign. A certain part of commodity is worth three makuts. Makuts is one unit of the cloth. Another is six makuts, another ten. It's as if they simply said three, six, ten. Mm -hmm. um, and then he says, you know, we can apply this to our own society. It's as if, you know, uh, all we can divide the value of the world's goods just by, the, by getting a certain number. Of makuts or whatever other arbitrary uh, unit you want to give it. Um, so here they use this makut as a metaphor for this universal accounting. You know, you, everything is just a number. But this misses the actual historical dimension of multiple accounting. As I said, multiple balance sheets, multiple monies, multiple prices relative to the observer. Um, so, so yeah, and then once economics kind of came along in the 20th century and they realized, oh, actually, you know, Starting economic analysis with the coin or coinage doesn't make sense because economic dynamism doesn't really come from the circulation of money. It comes from credit and um, and banking or financial structures. Um, and you know, coins in the end just represent kind of an already issued debt. And in a similar way, the trade on the West African coast it was it was a financial trade. It was a monetary trade because it operated by by credits. So. A lot of the goods they weren't transacted on the spot, you know, the imaginary would of barter, spot trade, immediate transaction, etc. It was kind of it had this, this financial dynamic of advances. So you advance broker some goods, you have to wait three to eight months, either more there or wait at your factory or your outpost for the traders to go inland, conduct the operation where they switched one type of goods for another type of goods at certain portions, come back with the goods, either slave or other goods. So this is a kind of you know financial monetary mode of production, even a kind of because credit incentivizes this thing, you know, trade, if you imagine trade as barter, because you know, people already have goods they want to get rid of, 
but no, the, the kind of dynamism is the fact that it's a kind of it's a monetary financial structure. Um, and I think with that, it was just to kind of to kind of show that you know this type of analysis, while it's been known, it's, it's clear in the source to the brokers, to the merchants. In the 1960s, it was clear to Bolani, to some of Bolani's readers, but this awareness totally disappeared in African economic history and other economic histories. Because they also, I think, is that you don't read widely enough, because if you, you, know, if you read European medieval history or other periods, you realize this imaginary unit is quite common. So, for example, from Mark Bloch, Land and Work in Europe. Um, it's these imaginary units of account are kind of uh, the dominant form because there's not silver. But here, nevertheless, it's a bit different because the imaginary units, the moneta imaginaria of kind of medieval Europe, the imaginary unit is still nevertheless a kind of ramage or weight of silver, a, a peso, a, a lira, a pound of silver, even though no one used silver because it wasn't any. But there's still it's still rooted in gravity, whereas the African units of account, um, they don't represent even that. So it's much more material. They kind of represent an extension of their own domestic economies. But nevertheless, only because there isn't, you know, this, this also argument made in the 60s, only because there isn't gold and silver doesn't mean it doesn't operate along monetary uh, logic. You know. um, so we would need to kind of revisit all these concepts of financial and monetary economics to understand the trade properly. Um, and starting with also inspired by the kind of medieval, rich medieval history about this, for example, Chipola money prices and so that during the world, 5th or 17th century. You know, he says, we want to know something about the matter. We must look first of all the original documents, monetary ordinances, the account books of the old merchants and trading companies, the contracts, the registers of the old banks and the units I'm saying that they represent these kind of contractual devices. Um, there, only there is the main clue to a solution to the mystery. Um, although one one thing I want to end on is the the classical political economy. It, at least it's honest more honest than the neoclassical, because, for example, here in the classical political economy, James Stewart, they also take a lot of examples of the, of the, of the Africans on the coast who trade with imaginary units. Um, here he says, you know, he recommends, you know, the, the, the merchants, how, how to operate the most profitable trade. It's like, says, you know, do not, do not reveal the original cost price. So don't engage in competition. Um, because if there is competition on the coast, then obviously another European will try to undersell the previous European, etc. And that will lead to this, in this kind of new classical dimension to the price converting towards the a kind of global price and kind of competitive price near the cost of production. But it says the most profitable thing is to, you know, to not have competitors. And the unit, that's what it represents, because even if there's another European trading country or competitor coming, they all are trading at the same unit. Um, so they don't actually reveal the they don't the, the price isn't isn't pushed down by competition because of this unit it kind of creates a separate track um, and this unit it's not really a source it, the profit here that's why when I think of merchant capitalism it's not really competition or arbitrage of different prices in different places uh, or speculation about the higher price of something there and going to sell it there um, because this implies also this competition or this kind of movement. Whereas I think the fundamental source of profit here is rent. It's a type of rent. You're sitting on the unit. You're insisting on the unit. You're not changing the unit. And the stability of the unit is actually the kind of the source of monopoly profits in the in the operation. So it's kind of um, and this continues up until World War One in in most places along the Gulf of Guinea, except Lagos, Gold Coast, etc., which introduced copper coins, silver coins, etc., because cash crop farmers are paid in these in silver coins. They insist. <coughs> Some traders insist on being receiving silver, but they don't because the merchants, the European merchants, insist on continuing with the set of trade. It's actually, you know, they refuse. The colonial government eventually comes in, forces markets, the institution of the market, price lists, payment in national units, etc. The colonial state actually introduces these things by force because the merchants had resisted. Um, and the, the idea here is also to you know, find sources of critique of economics because they misrepresent the, the trade, the volume of the trade, the structure of the trade. Um, the main misrepresentation is what I said is that they represent these goods as the things that are imported, iron, cloth, etc., as consumption goods. Um, 
And in economics, you can consume a certain amount of things. It's called an inelastic price. You can only consume a couple of cloths a year because that's all you wear. So there's no big demand for it. Uh, and you kind of, you consume it and, you know, the value is gone. Um, and therefore the theory of value becomes this utilitarian theory of value of utility. You know, how much do you want to consume something? So they start representing also the African elites as the consumers of the kind of vain, full of cupidity and corruption, kind of consuming expensive things at the expense of the population, that they're kind of just consuming luxury items. But it's actually not even luxury items, it's mass money items that are propagated across the entire society. Like, so the structure of the trade wasn't even this kind of, you know, luxury goods versus kind of, it, it, was, it was due to this kind of propagation of all these goods as monetary goods. Um, to pay social justice so, because otherwise you end up with a common narrative that is common both with the abolitionists and even some of the radical literature on the slave trade like Walter Rodney etc from 1960 where it's like oh the slave trade functioned by the exchange of worthless goods for slaves um, and this is kind of trope um, for example from Shakespeare a play The Winter's Tale where this character Aldo, Aldo Nicholas, he says you know he's a kind of uh, a dishonest merchant who kind of tricks people into buying his worthless jewelry, spells, and different kind of, you know, different kinds of especially the vain women who only know how to consume um, it's kind of super fluidities of decoration and bauble. A lot of the sources also refer to the bauble and trinkets. Ribbon, glass, which ballad, knife, state, etc. They crown around me as if my trinkets were blessed with what grace the buyer. So it gives this idea that the merchant is kind of, you know, um, uh, deceptive, deceiving, etc. But you know, it's more than that. It's you know, it's the entire rent uh, rent system of the, of the of the economy. And I think this is my last slide, just to say that you know, now the cloth is just a consumer good. Now it's clearly just consumer good. Now this it's African society's monies, um, colonial era monies, post colonial era monies, and they use that to to, to settle their social debts to. Um, but in the past, all these different goods represented the, the currency. And this is just to give a sense of complexity. This is actually just river catchment areas in Africa. There's the Congo River, Niger, the Sanaga, et cetera, different local rivers. And most of the different societies along the rivers had their own unit, a shared unit. Um, but even, for example, somewhere like the Congo, which is this area, different societies had their own type of traditional iron monies in different dimensions. So this is the fine one. Uh, this is the Deke one, these wonderful ones that I think for the East. So there's also multiplicity of different units in the pre colonial period before these commodity goods come. And obviously they get slowly replaced by these kind of imaginary units and <laughs> goods to settle their, their social things. So it's a very complicated process. And this complexity obviously is not, not appreciated in, in much economic history, um, which is a pity because then you can understand the source of. Of the, the, the structure of the trade, the, the dynamism, its motive, etc. Um, and then here, this is just to, to, to show the type of economic inspiration, you know, this kind of economic theory is, is greatly impoverished, especially when thinking about, you know, other, other well, even not thinking about Europe is impoverished. Um, for example, here he said, he talks about the Kyokos, which is a group also in the Congo, is like, you know, they're not really, they're not one category of people, they're not hunting people, they're not nomads, they're not agriculturists. They're not an industrial trading nation, they're all these at once. So it's kind of important to know that a lot of these trade goods they propagate in them through kind of not through a specialized merchant class that went everywhere and distributed these goods, but through the kind of social payments. And you know, for economics, uh, we have to look at the the empirics, etc., because you know, otherwise you uh, just create imaginary uh, versions of what trade must have been like, or as Kyle Bishop said, it's kind of, I think, the founder of economic anthropology, I would say, even before Malinowski, he says, you know, it has the advantage that the toy mannequin in the form of a savage, freely invented by the imagination of civilized man, vanishes from the scene and gives place to forms that are taken from life. You know, this economic analysis based in concrete facts rather than theory, but it's, uh, it's difficult to find these facts because they're dispersed in different archives, different sources that are but they're, they're clearly there. So, uh, with that, I just wanted to end because um, it, this thing with this map it shows that you know even 1900. This is Bock, Bockhaus Atlas 1897. 
it says gold is the yellow zones, gold standard zones, silver zones are blue, you know, China, India, Maria Teresa area. And these black areas basically help Africa, you know, as if there's kind of an absence of a relationship to the world economy, but it's not. Its relationship is linked via the students to the wider accumulation in hordes in gold and silver, etc. Um, rather than this blankness and also this blankness in economic theory. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to end. Thank you.